The Colonial Parkway in Virginia is a stretch of road that is a favorite of tourists, known for its beauty and a reminder of a bygone era. But in 1986, this beautiful roadway became a place of horror and savagery for two young women. Join us as we begin our discussion of the Colonial Parkway murders and dive into the darkness, one crime at a time. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Crime at a Time. I'm your host, Shannon. With me, as always, my sister from the same mister, Christina. Hey, everybody. How's it going? It's going all right. Good, good, good. You went back to work I last did. week. So it was hard. Congratulations. I had to work three days. I've had to work six days. I'm um, going, I'll be working <laughs> six days a week. Every three week for the next hard. three and a half months, the thanks three, to tax season. And next season. week I'll have to work five days, but the next week <gasps> I'll only have to work four. Why? Because we're out for Martin Luther King. Oh, King's okay. Birthday. I forgot. I don't get that day off because it's tax season, so we don't get any days off, so I always forget that it's in January. Yep. So, that's my life. <laughs> so I don't get off, any holidays. We're off. We got to work five days next week, and then four days the next week okay well you know you just should be lucky you have a job be thankful that you have I a job am, but it's just hard going back when you've been off three weeks <laughs> well you should just be like me and never get off never take off and never get a day off and then it wouldn't be any big but deal it's so nice having that time off well i wouldn't know. so anyway <laughs> We are going to get into it. Well, you know that we always read our reviews, and yes. we've gotten some more reviews in, but I'm only going to read one at, she per likes, episode. She likes to hold them back. Well, I'm always afraid that we're not going to get any more. She's scared y'all don't like us. <laughs> I have this fear that I'm going to run out. She she fears everything. It's like... I it's, don't fear everything. I fear snakes, and I fear fears, running out of reviews, and that's it. She fears it. people not liking her. No, I don't care, honestly. <laughs> what I, well, no, I, wait. <laughs> <laughs> what I care about is not having reviews to read for <laughs> episodes, <laughs> whether they're good or bad. I don't care if you like me or not. That's, she not, like, we that's like, not the point. We like for you to listen. Yes, we do. So this comes from Finn Fowler. All right, Finn. Finn. I love that name. I love Finn. This is a five-star review. All right. And he says, great research. This podcast really goes deep into each case. They don't just gloss over the same facts. I really appreciate the work that goes into it and the discussions that come out of that research is enjoyable to listen to. Good. So Thanks. We made Thank somebody you, happy. Thanks, Finn. We appreciate you listening. Thank you so much. We also have a new Patreon member that we would like to welcome, and it's Dara, a dear, dear friend of mine. She came in at the $10 a month level. Yay. So thank you so much. And her husband, he, John, is dealing with a very serious illness right now. So if you pray, if you could send prayers and good vibes to her and her family, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Um, I love you, girl. Thank you so much. Now, if you would like to be like Dara and support the show on Patreon. Everybody needs to be like Dara. <laughs> she does. She is an awesome person, y'all. Uh, for as little as a dollar a month, you can show your support for the show and help us keep the lights on around here. Yes, please. <laughs> The recorder's recording. We're in, dark, we're in the dark, but we're recording. I'm kidding. We're not. <laughs> are we? Yeah. Okay. We are recording? Yes, we're okay, recording. Good. We have several levels out there that include access to our exclusive Patreon feed that, that we post um, pictures, um, comments, stuff about the stories that we do on there. Uh, we do our monthly mini-sodes. Uh, we do one a month. You can get, yes. you can get access to that. Uh, there's also exclusive merchandise that you can get access to. And you can get access to commercial-free episodes. So if you're not into the commercials, you can go on there. And but we hope have, you are because they're great <laughs> products. <laughs> Every commercial is. You should Every, try these products. Everything you hear on this podcast, you should <laughs> please go buy it. They're great products. <laughs> Just try them. Just try them. Okay, so to our story, I'm going to ask you, have you ever heard of the Colonial Parkway murders? 
Oh, no. That's a no. <laughs> that means no. We are going to Thursday, October the 9th of 1986. Okay. 1986 being the best year of the whole decade of the 80s. I think there are several. I'm pretty sure 86 is the banner. Is the it's the banner year for the 80s I decade. don't know about that. Yeah. I mean, it was good. It was great. It was a great year. Okay. That was the year I got one of my teeth knocked out. <laughs> because I was riding on your shoulders in the living room. And I also got a stitches in my head right there because I hit my head on the corner of the couch when I fell mm-hmm. off your shoulders. Right. That's like, like I said, great year. <laughs> Thursday, October the 9th, 1986. Kathleen Marion Thomas, who went by Kathy. Okay. And Rebecca Andowski, who went by Becky. Okay. They were at the College of William and Mary, which is located in Williamsburg, Virginia. Okay. They were with friends Jolene Shira. Jolene. Jolene. (laughs) Props, Dolly Parton. (laughs) You're welcome. (laughs) Anyway, they were with friends Jolene Shira and Karen Miller in the computer lab in Barrett Hall. The reason they were there is because... Was to get an education, maybe? No. I'm about to tell you why. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm not mean, but I go to college. I'm about to, to tell you specifically why they were in the computer lab. To work on the computers? <laughs> maybe. Which you got to remember, know. this is 1986. But we still had computer lab in our school. We even did. In the 80s. And, we, and it I was, was the slowest computer ever. ever. And I would tear up some Oregon Trail. She showed, <laughs> That's all there was to do in computer but, lab. Yeah. <laughs> that's all we ever did. That's that all, was, that play was, games. <laughs> that was computer lab at my school. So Becky and Jolene were taking a class together, and they had a computer project that was due the next day. Okay. It was to be the last day of classes before the fall break, and Becky, who was 21, was planning on going home to Poughkeepsie, New York, to stay with her mom during the break. Okay. Now, she also had plans to stop and see her former roommate. She had actually transferred to William and Mary oh, okay. from Dick's, okay. Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. So she was. Well, she gets around, don't she? Yeah, she was going. Actually, she had plans to stop in Washington, D.C. and see some friends, and then stop by Dickinson and see her former roommate, and then head home to Poughkeepsie. Okay. The friend she was stopping to see in Dickinson was Sharon Spitali. 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 Now, Kathy, who was 27 years old and a graduate of the Naval Academy, was dating. Go, girl. Yeah, she's a badass. She She and Becky were dating at the time. And they had been introduced that prior spring by Jolene Shira, who happened to be Kathy's ex-girlfriend. They had oh, met. Oh, what a twisted way of <laughs> <we've laughs> I mean, they were. They had remained friends, and they had this little I'm tight kidding, circle. I'm kidding. And they had met when they were shipmates on the L. Y. Shipmates? <laughs> Did you say shipmates? Shipmates, okay. because they were in the navy. I swear it sounded like you said shipmates. <laughs> no. Ship <laughs> mate. Make sure you pronounce that P. P. I will put emphasis on yes. the P. Anyway, they had met when they were ship mates <laughs> on the L.Y. Spear while both were in the Navy. This is also where both women had met Karen Miller. Kathy was a member of only the second class at the Naval Academy that graduated women. Oh, cool. Yeah. So... I want to take a few minutes and talk about what this kind of meant in a historical perspective. And this is kind of some of the stuff that pisses me off. (laughs) So, I just want to get into it for a few minutes. Now, Kathy was born July 21st, 1959 in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay. And her father was stationed there because he was um, at Los Alamos to study atomic, atomic weapons. Which, okay. as we know, is where the atomic bomb was created and all that good stuff. Yes. She was the youngest of four kids and had three older brothers. So she was the only girl and she was the baby. Okay. Now, Spoiled. <laughs> Ooh, buddy, I bet. Now, her father and brother had also graduated from the Na- Naval Academy. And the Thomases were actually the first father, son, and daughter to graduate, to all graduate from the academy. Okay. Now, President Ford had signed a bill in 1975 that was that forced all of the military academies to accept women. Oh yeah. And Kathy entered 
she was in the second class that entered in 1977. Okay. And her brother tried to talk her out of it because he told her that it was going to be a nightmare. Well, yeah. And it was. Of course. Now, of course, the men, none of the men, of course, were on board with the well, women being accepted into the military academies or into the military in general for that matter and they sure didn't want them in the military academies where they would become officers that would be over other men so they did everything they could to make life miserable for these women they basically tried to break the women and force them out and this happened in all the service academies well, did, not just i'm not just singling out the navy Men didn't want women in the Navy, and they sure didn't want lesbian women in the Navy. <laughs> so, Kathy kept the fact that she was gay a secret because it was actually, at the time, and I don't know, we have some younger listeners, and I doubt they even realized this, that it was actually illegal for her to come out and be in the military. Yeah, She would have been arrested if she was in the military and came out as gay, she would have been arrested and court-martialed. So, basically, she could have been sent to jail for being who she was. Now, once she graduated in 1981, she owed the Navy a five-year stint. That was, well, yeah. that's the deal. <clears throat> but now, Kathy, her plan had been to make the, mil- the Navy her career. She yeah. wanted to be a career mil- um, naval officer. And... She gained the rank of lieutenant. Okay. And she attended the Surface Warfare Officer School in Newport, Rhode Island. And she completed six weeks, six weeks of training there because it was her desire to become a SWO on a combat vessel. Okay. Which was just, un- no woman had ever done well, that that's because, because they didn't no women allow had them. Been... Right. And they did, they weren't out. I mean, it was possible to do in theory, but in reality, it just wasn't possible for a woman to gain, to be stationed on a combat vessel at that time. I mean, I don't want to be bad-mouthing men. I'm not down on men by any means, but at this time, they, I mean, they just, they did everything they possibly could to force these women out of the military and out of the academy, especially. Been, and it could have been only a select few, not necessarily every single one of them. Well, I'm not saying it was. Pro- it was 99 percent of them. I mean, because now, like I said, uh, she was serving on the L.Y. Spear. That's where she met Jolene and Karen. Okay. Now she and Jolene started dating, but of course they had to keep it on the down low <laughs> because yeah. they. There was no way they could come out. And at the time, during the 80s, during this period, the Navy was actually actively investigating to determine if there were any gay or lesbian members in the military because they wanted to identify and get them identify them and get them out. Not right. just the Navy, but all, all, of them. all the um, branches of the military. <laughs> So they were actively, actively investigating this. Now, Kathy had a secret clearance, okay? And with a top secret clearance, you know, basically all of your communications are monitored. Yeah. So, I mean, even her phone, which we didn't have, there wasn't email, there wasn't text or anything like that. But phone. No, we lived <laughs> without technology and we survived and we liked it. <laughs> So, anytime she was on the phone, it was monitored. Yes. Um, not just on the ship or at work, but all communications. Well, yeah. Because they had to be sure that she wasn't. But it was all all the, all the of them in there. It wasn't just No, it wasn't her. just her, but I'm just, my point is so she, that she had to be extremely careful about yeah. what she even said over the telephone or anything. So, she had to be careful about what she wrote, what she did, how she acted, who she went out with, all of that. And 
that puts a lot of stress on a person when you're trying to keep a big secret like that. Now, Kathy herself never actually came out and had a discussion with her family about her sexual preference. (laughs) According to her brother Bill, as he says, quote, Mom and Dad were there over a weekend visiting. Okay. And this is after Kathy had bought a house. and Okay. And he continues on, Our parents were going to purchase an appliance as a housewarming gift. She didn't come out and say anything, but our mother noticed the sleeping arrangements and said that the relationship was something more than just roomies. So that they pretty much just figured, yeah, <laughs> figured it out. So she never really told them, but it was just kind of a known. The family knew. Yeah, they didn't care, but they did know. Now, in the spring of 1984, Kathy didn't know it, but the U.S. Naval Investigative Service which is NIS, which is mm-hmm. today is NCIS which for all you TV still, show fans. Which is still assholes <laughs> to a certain point. Yeah. There was a bar, no, it was called the Hershey. The Hershey. In Norfolk, and it was a known gay bar. Okay. Now, the, NC, the NIS actually had this bar under surveillance. They Because they were looking for members of the Navy who yeah. might be homosexuals. And according to the investigators, Kathy had been seen at the Hershey upward of 10 times prior to April of 1984. Damn. So my thing is, this this just irks me to no end. Because you've got people whose only job it is to go survey somebody to see if they're going to a bar. Yeah. I mean, it just irks me to no end. And... On several of those occasions, she was accompanied by another crewman from the L.Y. Spear. And last time that she had been seen, she had been with a civilian female that I'm sure was Jolene. And that she had introduced her as her lover. Because you had undercover agents and stuff going oh, yeah. into these bars talking to these people. So... On April the 26th, 1984, covert surveillance of Kathy's life began. Yeah. So they started following her. They started tailing her, watching her every single move. Mm Mm-hmm. She was seen with the other woman in her white Honda Civic, and a separate investigation was opened up on the person in the car with her, who, like I said, was most likely Jolene. Okay. Okay. There were nine investigators involved on her case. That means that there were nine people working for our government whose only job it was to was to find out if this woman was lesbian but or not. But she's not the only one. You're making it sound like they were just targeting her, but no, I guarantee you, but there you was she nine. Was not why the only would there one? have to be nine people working on it her case? It depends on what their job was. I mean, my God. I it's mean, because just, everybody, it's, it's just like it's just like in a police department. Everybody has a different job. Well, it's absolutely ridiculous that it takes nine people. No, it doesn't take nine just, people to follow her, but there may ridiculous. have different jobs. It just irks me to no end. So anyway, on May the 5th of 1984, the lead investigator attempted an impromptu interview with Kathy okay. and the suspected female subject, which is what she's called in the files, <laughs> female, female subject, subject, quotation marks, at Kathy's residence. So either, when they pull up, there's two cars in the driveway. So they're assuming that somebody has to be there. Oh, yeah. So they go up and knock on the door. Nobody comes to the door. So either Kathy was knew the jig was up or something and just was ignoring them and didn't come to the door, which is probably the most likely thing, or mm-hmm. they weren't there. But my guess yeah. would be that she's probably like, I ain't opening that door. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I open that door and my career's over. Right. You know? Right. Now, this didn't deter the investigators. They kept investigating, and they actually turned to her postman and were trying to and were questioning him about what type of mail she was getting and who it was addressed to and all this kind of stuff so they were intercepting her mail and looking through it so on june the 19th of 1984 the investigators they decided to step up their investigation so they actually 
brought her in for a formal inquiry. Okay. She was informed of her rights and declined to give the Navy the rights to search her premises, her, her well, house. She can do that. Yeah, because That's... they didn't have any calls to. No. And per regulations, the investigator also informed her captain um, that she was being accused of homosexual activity, including sodomy. No, wait, now, stop, first of all, stop, stop. Yes. <laughs> right. First of all, um, you do know what you have to have in order to commit sodomy, which, right? I mean, there's, there's ways, ways to get around but, that. But, I mean, most sodomy is. Uh, it's a, it's, a, it's first an all, organ, not a toy. And how did they know? Well, look, well, how did they know that? It's my question. But anyway, the whole thing's bullshit, in my opinion. The entire allegation against Thomas was that she had allegedly been seen going to a gay bar and had told someone there that she was with her lover. And that was the entire basis of this whole investigation. Now, the first thing she was forced to do was sign the Military Suspect Acknowledgement and Waiver of Rights. And it stated that what she was charged so with... So they read her her rights, but then made her waive her rights. Yes. It stated what she was charged with and her acknowledgement that she had the right... That she had the, the right to remain silent or make no statement at all. She didn't have to talk to him. So, it ended with her right to terminate the interview at any time. They interrogated her for almost two hours. Okay. And, according to her brother Bill, she relayed the following information. That she had never engaged in homosexual activity. She had never been to the Hershey bar. She had no knowledge of homosexual activity by her roommate or by her fellow shipmate. Which... We all know this is a lie, <laughs> but... Yeah, I get what, but, but again, that's in her way of thinking. If I tell them right. I've done this she stuff... She can't tell I them. See, that's what I mean. She, there's no way she can confess. If way, she confesses to this, she's done. Right, and that's the way people thought back then. Right. And that's what I mean by it being, it's wrong that she should be able to be herself, and I agree on yeah. that. But that's just the way it was, right. unfortunately. And, and she, so, I mean... Obviously, she had to lie. Yeah. There was no way for her not... They put her in a position to lie. Yeah. To them. It's not like... I really hope and they didn't really expect this woman who worked so hard, whose ambition was to become a service combat officer in the Navy, to walk in there and confess to something that she knew would get her thrown out of the Navy, discharged with a dishonorable discharge... Being from a Navy family, did they really expect her just to come in there and confess everything? Well, maybe they thought because she <laughs> was so honorable that, that she, she would. would. Well, they put her in a position where she couldn't be. You yeah. know? I mean, they forced her. They forced and her that, in. And that goes back to what I meant about it being a different time. She knew right. that she could not tell right. them Which is the sad. Truth. It's just it sad. Is. It is. Because you... you you should be able to be yourself no matter what. Right. So she ended the interview by saying that she was a Navy officer and a graduate of the academy and did not have to be interrogated in such a manner. She declined any further, further questions and terminated the interview. Now, without a confession on her part, they didn't have anything to go on. They didn't well, have duh. anything but innuendo and speculation. So... That terminated the, they terminated the investigation on August the 3rd. Good. So basically, them calling her in, her putting it into it, pretty much just put it into it. Well, so, oh, yeah. Now, Kathy, Kathy and Jolene, they ended up breaking up not long after that, which I'm sure was from all the stress of this well, yeah. whole crap I mean, going yeah. on. And I could see where Jolene's coming from. Yeah. Look, I can't. Right. Do this. Well, you it know. may have been Kathy that said, you well, know, I can't it, do it, this anymore. It may have been, but I could see Jolene being I, I think being it was just one. a mutual thing because yeah. they did remain really close friends. But I'm just saying, I can see her, look, I can't go through this anymore. Yeah. Is all I'm saying. I just I just think that it, it, I think everything took a toll on Kathy. All the pressure, all the lies, all the looking over your shoulder, everything. Yeah. So after five years, she made the decision to get out of the military. 
right. to get out of the Navy. And she ended up resigning her Navy commission in May of 1986. But she did retain a commitment to the Navy Reserves. Okay. She then took a job at Brokers Security Incorporated in Virginia Beach, in Virginia Beach, <laughs> where she worked as a stockbroker. And this is where okay. she was working in October of 1986. <clears throat> All right. Now, Becky Dowski, and we'll talk about her for a few minutes. She was born in the state of New York on July 21st of 1965. Okay. She was the youngest of five children, and the family was pretty much the center of her life. She adored her older siblings and her nieces. She was also very athletic, and she excelled at a wide range of sports, um, basketball, especially softball. And when she was in high school, the family actually moved to Paris because her father took a job there, and it was while they were in Paris. Now, Paris, France, Paris, Texas, or Paris, Paris Tennessee. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. To Paris, France. Okay, thank you. Just to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to be Somebody sure. Somebody in Texas was going, man, she lived here? Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, I had to, I had to okay, clarify. Good, good, good question, good question. It was Paris, France. Okay. I, I, I did not... Think to clarify, okay. but they, but thank you for asking the question. You're welcome. So, <laughs> so while they were in Paris, her father announced that he was leaving their, her mother. Wow! So her gonna leave her mother in France, <laughs> move on. Now I got now to it. Now well, he saying, ain't kidding about leaving his family. He moves them to a foreign country. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm kidding. He stayed in Paris working, and her mom actually moved back to Poughkeepsie, and Becky came back to live with her mom in New York. Okay. Now, in the autumn of 1983, Becky had enrolled at Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Um, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. <laughs> I don't know why I said it. Let's just how it came out. I don't know why I said it like that. Now, there she was a star on the school softball team and was named MVP and Mid-Atlantic All-Conference team member. Okay. Now, after two years at Dickinson College, she decided that she would rather pursue a business degree instead of a liberal arts degree. So Good, she, good, good move. <laughs> <laughs> she's a smart girl. Good move there on your part. That was why she transferred to the College of William and Mary in January of 1986. Okay. And that's where she was introduced to Kathy Thomas in the spring of 1986. All right. Now, this relationship with Kathy was actually Becky's first lesbian relationship. And she had not told her family about Kathy or that she was gay. So her family did not know. Okay. Okay. That she was even seeing. Anybody. Well, maybe her family had been through enough since their father moved them to France, and then he. And it could be that she wasn't that state. she was at a point in her life where she wasn't really sure. Right. So she was just you know questioning her sexuality. So she's, I don't know. Anyway, but she had not, which I can understand. I didn't come out to anybody till I was thirty six years old. So she's twenty one. So I can t totally understand. <laughs> so. That takes us back to Thursday, October the 9th, 1986. Okay. Now, Becky's activities were logged by the campus computer network. At around 6.30 p.m., she logged off at Barrett Hall and walked to Morton Hall, which was about a block away. She logged on there for a few minutes, which I'm sure was to use the printer because I don't know if people... people remember but most of the time in those big computer areas the printer was lo not located <laughs> it wasn't where the actual computer you had were. to walk like halfway across the campus <laughs> just to go to print, print something, to get out. something off of the printer so uh, the, it was presumed that she just logged on long enough to print what she had been working on right. in the computer lab now becky and kathy were last seen near becky's dorm at chandler hall a short time later it was the last confirmed sighting of the pair by anyone other than their murderer. Well, yeah. Dum, dum, dum. That's always the last Foreshadowing. person. Foreshadowing. That's always the last person to see anybody <laughs> alive was the person who killed them. <laughs> Amazing how that works, isn't it? It's 
crazy. I know. <laughs> Man, I thought it's, it's, it's crazy. It's always, 100% of the time, <laughs> the last person to see them alive <laughs> when someone was murdered was their murderer. <laughs> <laughs> it or, never the mur- fa- or the murderer's buddy. <laughs> that, stati- that statistic never, never, never varies. <laughs> I would like to see some information on these statistics. <laughs> Unless they didn't completely die and they're just laying there like gurgling or something. Right. And somebody walks up. But they're not a murderer. But then they're not murdered. No, they're not. They're still alive. But they were murdered. I mean, because oh, they you're died shortly they die after. later. Yeah. Okay. So, like, it could have been the ambulance driver. Could have been. See, you, see, I told you, your, but your statistics are flawed. Okay, I will, I will, 99% of the time, when someone is murdered, your the last person to see them alive is their murderer. Because <laughs> most of them are going to make sure they're dead before they leave them. Probably. Okay. Now, Becky's car, it was loaded down with all of her stuff because she was planning on going out of town the next day. I'm getting my shit and getting out of here. Because, <laughs> you know, she was planning on leaving the next morning after class. So, the women left the campus in Kathy's 1980 white Honda Civic 1300 DX oh two-door hatchback. Oh, my God. Or what me and my friends refer to as a Ziggy car. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you why. No, please don't. We had an English teacher oh in school God. who looked like Ziggy, and he drove a Honda Civic 1300 DX two-door hatchback, and we called it the Ziggy car. Okay. So, they left campus in Kathy's Ziggy car. It is believed that the women may have gone to probably get something to eat. Okay. And there have been reports that have not been confirmed or verified by the police that they were seen. They haven't been confirmed yet, and this was back. The police haven't come out publicly and said this is fact. Oh, okay. That they were seen at a restaurant called the Yorktown Pub. Yorktown Pub. Now, Let's York, go there. The is York, still open? I have no clue. <laughs> now, the Yorktown Pub is a local bar rest, and restaurant. And was only 1,250 yards from the start of the Colonial Parkway. I bet they've got some good food there. I'm <laughs> hungry. I haven't had anything to eat yet. <laughs> you just ate like a whole lot of chips and I ate and like seven chips dip. and dip. <laughs> I like my, seven chips. In my house a few minutes ago. Seven chips. That's not a whole lot. <laughs> I think you had more than seven. I had, no, because they were little crumbs. So if you put it all together, oh, it's only oh, seven oh, chips. Oh. Okay. So, oh, there. <laughs> let's talk a few minutes about the Colonial Parkway. Do you know what the Colonial Parkway is? It's a road. <laughs> <laughs> it's a parkway. <laughs> you park on it. <laughs> and, and, and drive in driveways. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, the Colonial Parkway is part of the National Park Service, and so it's federal property. Aren't all roads pretty much state and federal property? Yes, but this one is federal because it's part of a state par- I was just pointing out that it's federal jurisdiction. Okay. Okay. The Colonial Parkway is a 23-mile scenic road ra- roadway <laughs> stretching from the York River at Yorktown to the James River at Jamestown. Oh, man. I bet that's a beautiful drive. It is. It connects Virginia's historic triangle, which is Jamestown, Williamsburg, and Yorktown. Yes. Oh, the man. parkway was completed in 1957, and the planners, what they were trying to do was recreate the experience of traveling on, like, a dirt road during of the course. colonial era. Yeah, of course. So, the road did not have the traditional roadway markings of a modern road, and red bricks were actually used for many of the bridges and overpasses yeah. to create the illusion that they were centuries old. The parkway was paved with a special mix of marl, which I think is a local It's like a gravel, gravel and concrete. Mm-hmm. So the so cars that are driving on it make a low roaring sound, mm-hmm. so you can hear cars coming. Yes. Okay, that's going to be important later, so remember that. Now, access to the parkway is limited. There are seven interchanges and 
only five entrance points to the roadway, mm-hmm. and the majority of those are in the Williamsburg era. Okay. Area. Area. Era. Era. That was a long time to go. <laughs> Jeez. Are they still safe to go yeah, there? I wouldn't use them. <laughs> I'd be careful. On a side note, we did have a, like a great, great, great uncle that helped found the James Jamestown, Virginia. All right, cool. go us. Yes, go us. We also had a cousin that disappeared with the people in the lost city of Roanoke. So I don't know how good lost that Colony is. Of Roanoke? You for the real? lost colony. Yeah. What was his name? Uh, Isaiah. Isaiah Hovey. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Isaiah Hovey. Mm-hmm. Well, we're gonna, okay, Daniel guys. Hovey is the one that helped found the town of Jamestown, Virginia. So Daniel Hovey and Isaiah, Isaiah Hovey, because you know their names were their England. names were written down in the lost city of Roanoke and the, the people who were supposed to be there, and his <laughs> name was on the list. Cool. Anyway, so anyway, I'm done now. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> that's for, a history lesson. Our ancestry dot minute. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Ancestry.com. They can give you a lot of great information. (laughs) Okay. So, as I was saying, there's really limited... Once you get on the parkway, there's limited places for you to get on and off. So, once you get on it... You're there. You're there. For a while. Yeah. So... There's also no street. There was no street lights, no Well, it would have to be authentic so they wouldn't put street lights. Because there wouldn't have been... In the Williamsburg era. <laughs> Area. <laughs> now, all along the parkway, there are half moon pull offs. Okay. Like, like there would be like in a park where you can like, like sight, see like the yes. view and stuff. Okay. It's half moon pull offs and parking areas so that you can get out and kind of take Look in around, the view of take the rivers the view, and right. everything. Now, they also, at that time, had other parking areas that were more secluded. Oh, people would go there to catch up, wouldn't they? Now, these were picnic areas like Ringfield Plantation area. And these places are now closed, the ones that were more off of the parkway. Okay. Because they were having issues with these places at night. Were people catching up or like... Yeah, no. They had... They were used as lover's lanes, places for low-level drug deals, gay cruising... A lot of, um, it was kind of a well-known area of homosexuals to go out where they could not be seen. Okay. At night, you know, all of these places, even the little pull-offs, they were, some, were sometimes used as lover's lanes and places for low-level drug deals Let's as well. And that was because the parkway at night was not heavily patrolled at all. Because you kind sometimes... like the road I live on, no police presence <laughs> whatsoever. You maybe sometimes had one ranger on uh, duty no, at night. Maybe. Maybe out there. <laughs> and another good reason was it was really dark out yes, there. There weren't any street lights. And because you could see... It was and nature. Because you could see and headlights he, and, and hear. hear cars coming. Right. You could hear the cars before you could even right. see the headlights on right. those roads. Because I know what they're talking about with those roads. Yeah. And, and at night... The parkway kind of took on a different culture because during the day it's just full of tourists, you know, going between these three creepy <laughs> tourist locations. But at night, you know, it was, you know, kind of a different domain. It was down creepy. There. It yeah, was it creepy. was creepy. So, like I said, you know, local teenagers would go there, buy drugs, or to make out, or party, just, you know, have fun. Because they just have fun. Now, there's also been reports that there were peeping toms that would creep up to the cars to watch couples. <laughs> That's just <laughs> weird. Isn't it though? I read that. I'm like, they what? Made, okay, in the 80s, they had <laughs> porn that you could buy and legally watch. Yeah, well, I mean, you could you could even kind of, um, if you had, if you squinted, if you turned on Cinemax and squinted really hard, you could kind of see through like all the, because they used to have it scrambled unless you paid for it. <laughs> Yeah. And Cinemax used to be called Skinemax because at night on they Cinemax, would show porn. <laughs> right? Who doesn't know this? I Any, bet kids today don't know this. Well, that's because young, they can I bet get porn people, on YouTube now. I bet young people today don't know that. All they got to do is look up Pornhub. They can get free porn all but, along. But yeah, if you didn't back then, you couldn't. <laughs> if you didn't pay for Cinemax, if you squinted just you right, you to squint really hard. <laughs> You could kind of make Don't out naked how people. we know this. <laughs> you could kind of... Oops. Go ahead in the microphone. 
you could kind of make out naked people. kind of what they were doing. <laughs> I don't know. I think I enjoyed the storylines more. <laughs> I just squinted for the story. I wasn't I was paying attention for to the, the storyline. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> You're so stupid. <laughs> so, because of all the stuff going on out there at night, most of the locals avoided that stretch of road oh, yeah, during the night. <laughs> I ain't going other. Honey, we need to go back. Oh, we're going to go another one. We, well, that's an hour out of the way. I don't care. <laughs> we ain't going out there. We're not going that way. Now, there are two government installations along the Colonial Parkway. The first was the Cheatham Annex, which was a U.S. Navy base situ- situated along the York River. Okay. The other was Camp Perry, which was a 9,000-acre mm-hmm. facility. It was created in 1942 for yes. training purposes. Yes. And Camp Perry was known as the CIA's training facility mm-hmm. or what most civilians know it as the farm yes that's the colonial parkway yes so the next day friday october the 10th kathy thomas did not show up for work Uh oh. and she didn't call the office which she had flexible hours so she could kind of make her own hours right where she worked but usually even if she on her days off she would call and let somebody know that she wasn't coming into the office okay now, keep in mind that this happened over Columbus Day weekend. So, I mean, they they called her home. She didn't answer. And, you know, she since it was a long weekend and she was known to take off, she usually took off on Fridays a lot. She okay. was known to, like, really love long weekends. So there wasn't a lot of concern because they figured that she had just taken off for the weekend since it, since Monday was going to be a holiday. Okay. Now, when Becky didn't show up for class, Jolene Shira went looking for her and found her car parked where it had been the night before. Karen Miller was also concerned because Karen actually worked with Kathy at the um, brokerage firm. Okay. And... Kathy's no-show combined with Becky's car being on campus, it kind of made Karen and Jolene nervous, but they didn't feel the need to really alert anyone because they just figured, I guess. I'm having a feeling that that was the wrong decision. (laughs) Something in the back of my mind. Something in the back of your mind. Is telling me. Now, two more days passed, and the disappearance of the two women went unreported. And some of this was due to the fact that Becky's plans were not really very specific because she had told her mom, you know, I'm going to go stop by Washington, I'm going to stop by Dickinson, and then I'll be home. So right. if she didn't really have a tell her family, you know, I've got a concrete plan to be here, 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 and here at this specific time. Right. And now she did tell her friend, um, Sharon, that she was going her ex roommate that she was going to see she was supposed to be meet her friday night and she didn't show up for that and it kind of you know gave sharon some concern but you know not enough to reach out she just figured that maybe becky had changed her mind which she thought was odd because it wouldn't be like becky just to not tell her that her plans had changed okay and you know kathy you know she had a tight circle of friends but none of them really seemed to notice that she wasn't available because this was before you had constant contact with everybody 24 7 yeah you either had to go to their house or get them on a house phone or they could be run to the store or something (laughs) like that you either call a pager yeah i miss pagers (laughs) pagers were all did they have pagers i'm sure they had pagers yes they had pagers in the 80s but that wasn't i don't think it was like till the early 90s that everybody was like we gotta have a pager but I'm sure she, being like a stockbroker, I'm sure she had she a did. pager. I don't think she did. I said maybe she had a pager. But maybe. But I mean, you just you just called if you if you needed to talk to somebody, you called them at home or you called them at work, and that and was, that the was only pretty. Place. Or you went to their house or their place of work, and that was pretty much that it. That was it. That's the only way you could get up with somebody. If you broke down, you had to walk ten miles. <laughs> Watch the movie National Uphill Lampoon's Vacation. <laughs> that explain that will explain the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> how we had to live. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's an awesome movie. So, the evening of Sunday, October 12th, 
Okay. Of 1986, which went, which I will just say was Kirk Cameron's 16th birthday. Oh my God. <laughs> I have his birthday. And you're going to get mad at me for actually tying into the story with our family history, but yet you're going to talk about Kirk Cameron's birthday? He was like my total crush when I was younger, and for some reason I cannot get his birth date out of my head. Because you're crazy. It's October 12th, 1970, and it will not leave my head, and every time I see that date, it's the only thing I think about. Now, the evening, so the evening of Sunday, October 12th, between 5.30 and 5.45, a jogger on the Colonial Parkway at the Bellfield Plantation pull-off near Kilometer. When did we go to Canada? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> <laughs> near mile marker nine. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> noticed that something was amiss. So the pull-off was, you know, it was basically just a little parking area, like seven-car parking area. Like I said, it was a half moon configuration, and most of the vehicles, if they were parked there, would only be about 10 to 15 feet away from the roadway. So this was not off of the road by any means. Okay. Now, the pull-off allowed visitors to park and look out over the York River. Right. And it was near the Cheatham Annex, which was the Navy base. Mm Mm-hmm. And the jogger had noticed that the bushes were kind of broken at the edge of the pull-off. Now, right before the fifth, there was a 15-foot drop-off to the river below. So, if you fell off. So, they could have fallen off the cliff if they got close enough to it. So, he moved in a little closer to look over the drop-off, and he saw the rear of the Civic just over the embankment as if someone had tried to drive the car out of the parking area and into the York River. (laughs) I'm psychic. So, of course, he contacts the park rangers. Now, the first park rangers to arrive on the scene were Jim Redford and Bird Yule. Bird? Bird Yule. The great, one of the great names. We may have to add that to our list of awesome There's names. There's so many of them now. Do we even remember what all of them were now? Y'all let us know. Because I don't know if we can remember. I remember Bird Yule. Now, to them, you know, it kind of looked like a... Must have been an auto accident. Well, yeah. Like somebody had like they just... rolled off the cliff. Now, the vehicle was actually perpendicular to the parkway, so it kind of looked like if it had have been an auto accident, somebody they went would have off been... the curb and. No, they would have had to have been sitting crossways in the road and then just hit the gas and just went straight toward the river. <laughs> Unless so... they were dodging a rabbit <laughs> and turned their wheel. And went down. Yeah, I guess so. That could happen. <laughs> or they would dodge him Bigfoot. That's what it was. Hey, I probably... Or the flying elk up there. I hear the elk up there could fly. You heard wrong. <laughs> I don't know who told you that. I saw a picture. <laughs> I heard. I saw it on YouTube. I saw it on Facebook. I did. No, I'm kidding. So the only thing that actually kept the car from going into the river was that it got hung up on like the thick bush and brambles see this is why you should not clean up the underbrush out of everywhere because it will keep (laughs) you from going into the river right may kill you but it'll keep you from going into the river right the rangers crawled out toward the honda and so the rangers then noticed that there were the body there were no bodies in the front two seats okay one body was in the back seat and one was in the far back of the hatchback. Okay. One of the rangers, and we're not sure who, shattered the back window of the hatchback. Oh, well, yeah. And I'm sure that was to see, see if, if the they were alive, were alive. Or if they, if they could help. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he wasn't trying to hurt them. Well, no, of course not. When they shattered that glass, the whole car sh- was sm- smelled of diesel fuel. Okay. Those cars didn't use diesel fuel. No, they fuel. did not. Now, they noticed that this was clearly not an auto accident. They noticed that the young women's throats had been cut. And so they climbed into the car enough to check both women to see if they had a pulse or anything. And, of course, they did not. They were both cold to the touch and had been dead for some time. Okay. Now, the rangers still were really unsure what they were dealing with, so they contacted emergency services. My guess would be you're dealing with two murdered people. I would think so. But, you know, they they still called EMS. Well, yeah, they have to. They also called the FBI. 
since it's government property. Right. That's right, because it's federal property. Right. Now, by the time that the FBI arrived, um, additional park rangers had converged at the turnoff. They just wanted to see what was yeah, going on. It was Herman Hardy, Clyde Herman Yee. Hardy. <laughs> Herman Hardy. <laughs> Herman Hardy, Clyde Yee. Oh, wow. And Ken Johnson. Wow. And the rangers and the emergency services team, they had to cut a path alongside the car to try to get down to the victims to get into the car to see if they could right. get them out. To see if there was any chance of saving your life. I don't think so. Which I don't think so either because if those rangers, the, the rangers that already noticed that their throats were cut, they were cold and, and had noticed stiff. that they had been, yeah, they were because they have um, been dead a while. Special Agents John Mabry and J.C. Cross, they were the first FBI agents on scene. Okay. And they go down, you know, to the car, and they were trying to decide if it was best to leave the car where it was and try to investigate it, or to pull the car back up to the pull-off. Are you going to put a rope on every time you want to go down there and look for evidence? Well, the thing the is, it had already been... Everybody and their brother had already been okay, in the and car. Okay, and I get <laughs> so, that, but that's a totally different scenario as other times because they were down there. They had this car that they thought was a motor vehicle accident, and they were trying to help these people. Right. Which so I that's a completely I'm, different scenario as you see three dead bodies laying there and 20 people are just walking around it. Well, I understand that. So they made the decision to pull the car up. Right. So they could get to it easier. So... Um, the two FBI agents, they began to check to see who the victims were. They found two purses under the seats. One had the wallet in it, which was Becky Dowski's, and it had her, they were able to identify her because it had her William and Mary student ID card in there. Okay. The other purse had the wallet out, as if the driver had taken it out for some reason, and that one had the driver's license for Kathy Thomas. The <laughs> FBI also noticed... That both girls' wallets had money in them. Okay. So robbery, they didn't feel no, was a motive. I wouldn't think it would be. And, of course, the stench of diesel fuel was on every, just clung to the whole interior of the car. I'm wondering if they thought if they pu pushed the car down in there with the diesel fuel in it that somehow it would explode. Well, I'm about to, we're going to go over that in a minute. There were tire prints that were a short distance up the turnoff on the grass that kind of seemed to match the tire prints of the Honda. So they were like, well, had the car been over there before it had been pushed over the side of the okay. turnoff? Now, near where the car had gone over, there were a number of burned matches. So the FBI assumed that somebody had doused the car with diesel fuel. Okay. And tried to ignite it. Okay. But this had to be a person that didn't understand. Diesel fuel does not light easily. It does not heat up quickly. And it also does not explode easily. It does like not. Think it, it does, does. not. Ca it, it's hard. It's hard to get, to get diesel, diesel fuel, fuel to, to catch, catch on fire. fire. <laughs> right. It's very hard. Now, regular gasoline and kerosene, yes. Now, but kerosene. Not not yeah. diesel fuel. Car yeah, diesel fuel does not It does ignite. not burn as easily as people think it does. Now, it looked like, like I said, there were a lot of matches. So it looked like somebody had just stood there doing matches trying to get the car to catch on fire. And right. I guess when they couldn't get it to catch on fire, they just went ahead and pushed it over the... So for all of you people that are planning on burning <laughs> something down with diesel fuel... Don't use diesel fuel. Don't use diesel fuel. It won't fuel. work. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> don't do that. Don't. Don't. It's not a good don't idea. Don't do it. Don't do it. They also noticed that the driver's seat was actually further back than it should have been for Kathy or Becky to be driving that car. So it's very possible that he could have moved the car around to push it off into the ravine, and that was what was sitting in the grass further up. And when he killed him, he didn't know what to do. Maybe he was just going to leave the car sitting there. Right. And then said, no, I can't. So he backed it up, pushed it down the ravine, and then tried to set it on fire. Right. So the uh, medical examiner shows up, and they take pictures. They process the crime scene, and they get the bodies out of the car. 
Kathy was removed from the rear hatch, and Becky was removed through the driver's door. Inside the car, they found some blood, but not nearly enough to make them think that the murders happened in the car, because there would have been a lot of blood if their throats had been cut in the car. They also found other things in the car. On the front passenger floor was a flyer for the Holy Alamo Christian Church, and a Carly Simon cassette tape for her album, album Torch. The keys to the Honda were found on the driver's side floor, the radio was dislodged and partially pulled out from the dashboard. There was a McDonald's game card piece with a picture of Jeff Bostick of the Washington Redskins that was face down on the dashboard. On the rear of the driver's side floor, under where Becky was laying, there was a blue blazer that was still on the hanger. Under that jacket was a barrel-style shaped gym bag that was black with red straps and under the bag was a small blue cardboard carton that nobody really knows where it came from or what it was for on the rear seat midway between the back and front seats were shorts that were stained with blood and in the trunk where kathy's body had been placed there was a poster and a map now, when they examined the bodies, they found that both women's necks had been cut from left to right, which would indicate that the killer was right-handed if he had cut their necks from behind. They both had ligature marks on their necks and wrists. Kathy actually had some strands of hair in her hand that were presumably from the killer. Uh, Kathy Thomas had a deep one-inch knife wound in her lower left thumb, and it was actually in the little area between the okay, thumb and your pointer finger. Okay, I was how do you get a one-inch knife wound in your thumb, but I guess it between was the thumb. In, those, in that little area between. Oh, uh, I know, right? I she was dead when that happened. Uh, I'm assuming that's probably from her fighting, I would I imagine. would think so, but God bless her. Ro um, Becky Dowski had cuts on her left thigh. Now, both women also had undigested meat in their stomachs. Okay. That was an indication they had eaten a hamburger or something similar prior at to least their death. At least no more than an hour before because it mm. would have started Sometime digesting. Sometime that before their death, yeah. And the time of death was really impossible to establish. And all the medical examiner could confirm was that they had been dead for at least 24 hours before they were the found. examination. Before right, they because found. the reason he can't determine that is a lot of people say well they determine it with rigor mortis but right. they lost a lot of blood and your body stiffens the more blood it right. loses so you cannot determine when there's a lot of blood loss yeah now um tangled up in well just under kathy's hair in the back okay under her hair just above her left ear was a small piece of plastic rope or line Okay. The piece was just over one inch in length and had been somehow cut off during a struggle with the killer or after he or she had killed, killed her. Now, how that was cut was kind of, they were trying to figure out how exactly that could have happened, except that maybe it had been removed when the rope was cut from their necks. Yeah. Because it was as if, because the, the killer didn't leave the rope or the bindings or anything Right. Behind. They took all of that with them. So I'm assuming that that little small piece under her hair, when they were cutting it off, it just got missed. Yeah. I would think. Yeah. By the killer. But I would, it's just strange to me because I would think that the rope would have had to have been around her neck when her throat was cut. Yeah. In order for both ends of that line to be cut. Does that make sense? Because if the, somebody was just cutting the rope off of her neck, they would just cut it, and one cut would bring it off. But this was a one-inch piece, so it had to have been cut on both sides. Unless it was something that was just shed off the rope. Yeah, I guess. Because rope sheds. Been. It could have been. Now, there were ligature marks deep and visible around the necks on both women and both women showed signs of bruising um like they had been not beat but just manhandled right okay. you know pretty had been handled pretty roughly on thomas's right butt buttock butt cheek there was a weird eerie hand-shaped bruise 
Neither woman showed any signs of being raped or anything like that. Rape tests and swabs were administered anyway, though, just as a matter of protocol. Their throats had been cut severely, and in fact, Kathy Thomas had suffered a subtotal decapitation um, with the blade almost severing her head from her body. Yeah. The slash on Becky was deep as well, but not nearly as deep as the one on Kathy. And I don't know if that's because more of more anger was directed at Kathy or if it's because she, she was, was struggling. She was more. fighting back more. Mm-hmm. It could be either one. It could. Now, the death certificates for both women listed respiratory arrest due to lig- ligature strangulation as the cause of death. So, in other words, cutting their throat had been really unnecessary. Yeah, because they were already already dead. Now, you say that, but what I have, what confuses me about this, because that's what is on the death certificates. However, in interviews that Kathy Thomas' brother, Bill Thomas, has given, he says that the FBI told him that their hearts were still beating when their throats were cut. And it could very well be. Because, and that that was the cause of death. But that's not what the cause of death is on the death certificate. No, because I'm going to tell you, when you lose lack of oxygen, your heart can beat, still beat. Right. For actually a couple, two or three minutes. Yeah, but that wouldn't be the cause of death, though. It would just be that your throat was cut after you were, I just, it's just a discrepancy. So I'm not sure. I mean, you got to go with what's on the death certificate, right? Well, yes, you have to. I'm not. I don't mean this to sound harsh, but how how they died, knowing that their throat was cut and they were strangled. Does which one of them on the death certificate really matter? No, I mean yes, it does because when you're investigating a murder, that's what that's. What, but what I'm saying is, is either one of them would be a murder. If right, they were but, with, but my thing is, is cut the cutting of the throat was that to kill them or was that just done after they were dead because that indicates a different uh, here's what I think happened a different offender a different type I of think a mindset they, for an offender I think with the lack of oxygen yes they were pretty much dead because without oxygen for like two minutes your brain starts to die which your brain controls your whole body your heart can still beat so this is what I think I think that whoever killed them realized their heart was still beating thinking they were still alive, cut their throats. Well, then why wouldn't the cuts on the throats be the same, and why would Kathy's be deeper? Who knows? See, that's what I'm not, that's what's confusing me. If... And it could just be that he just cut it deeper. I mean, or she, or who knows? I mean, I just, because also on the death certificates, they had a description of their injuries, and it's stated strangled and throat cut by unknown assailant. Yeah. So, I think it's important to call the actual cause of death. If they were strangled and then their throats were cut, that means a totally a a whole, different but, thing than if they were their throats were cut to kill them. But let me, but let me, let and me, the let me try was to just explain to, this in an easier way. You know when someone is brain dead in the I hospital? I understand what you're saying. I, they're I just, clinically dead. It, that's not my point. My point is that it, expl- it it tells you something different about the offender. Uh, but, but, maybe. No, definitely. I it mean, definitely tells you something different. Because if this person, if they were already dead, if they had already strangled them and then cut their throat, and the c- cuts were different, then that means that there was more violence directed at Kathy because she well, wouldn't have been Well, then that's what you're going to have to go on because that coroner and that medical examiner can look at the lungs and all of that, look at the trachea, look at everything to tell. If the trachea was crushed before the in a place where the throat was not cut, then yes, that's what killed them. Right. So that's my point. It, it does matter. I think it matters a lot because it tells you about the offender... It's mindset and intentions. That's my Well, then point. that's what you're going to have to go on. Right. That's my point. Since it's, it's listed the way it is, that's what you're going to have to go on. Right. So, 
they were strangled to death and then their throat was cut but that doesn't make sense unless they were strangling them while they, they cut, were cut their, their throats. throats either way it was overkill right right exactly exactly yes so i mean either way it was overkill which goes back to my theory of how that rope piece that may have gotten cut is if they're if they had if they had her the rope around kathy's neck while they were cutting her throat it may have just gotten cut then it could have and then they just cut another piece to cut it off of her while she was laying down or something Mm -hmm. and left that little piece behind and it got caught up in her hair and stayed there but that would mean to me that they would have had to have cut her throat from the front for that to be possible because they would have to be pulling the rope against her neck from the back not necessarily for, well for that piece just to get hung up there i would think unless because when they cut still, her throat it would it have was, been, it would have made her head go back unless it was still just like clinging to the rope and they pulled the rope through the back and it just got hung there when it left the rope i don't know it just it's just weird that it's just that one little piece and it could have been that it was on the floor and when they went to pick them up and move them it got caught in her hair yeah then where but i don't know it's just weird so the police force they began trying to piece together every little detail of you know these girls lives and becky's dorm room they sealed it off and they and William and Mary actually hired a security guard that checked her room every few hours, I guess, just to see if anybody, sure nobody nobody was in messing there. with it. They actually hired more security guards. They put in new card readers for access to the dorm rooms. They installed um, Basically, they just phones in security. public areas. They up security. I guess, all as it seems to me, this was done because maybe there was an indication that someone from the school had followed them or had intercepted them at the school. And they had had actually had a student that was raped on campus uh, earlier that month. Okay. And I'm sure a lot of that went into all these extra precautions they're taking, too. But for all that, I mean, I don't know if it's just the college overreacting or if the police gave them some kind of indication that maybe they were followed from the school. Right. So the FBI is trying to figure out where these girls were for this missing block of time from when the last time they were seen Thursday night to when the car was actually found Sunday uh, Sunday they morning. Were, they were being murdered. Or Sunday afternoon, I'm sorry. It was actually found Sunday evening. So, had the car been there the whole time? If it very, was, very how well could it possible. have gone unnoticed for so long? Because a lot of people just didn't realize yeah. that if they I were mean, driving nobody, down If the nobody road, had stopped at that turnoff right. and got nobody out Nobody would looked, have noticed. Right. Had the, they were wondering if the victims had been in that car the whole time or if they had been held somewhere. The fact that they had food in their stomach that had not been digested led investigators away from the thought, really, that they had been held hostage. Because they're probably not getting fed very well if they're being no. held hostage. They were killed not long after they encountered yeah. whoever killed them. And I think pretty quickly the FBI yeah. came to the conclusion that they were more than likely murdered the night that they disappeared or into the early hours of Friday morning. But it wouldn't have been too long or that food would not have still been in there, depending on what time they ate. Right. And there were other questions like, did the murderer bring the car to the parkway? after the women's deaths did he encounter them on the parkway were they did they intentionally go to the parkway you know there were really there was really no evidence that pointed to if they were there on purpose or if they had been brought there after they were killed to the parkway i would go I mean, for the latter i'm pretty sure because, I mean, From, on that now, parkway, it would, too, it would be hard to get somebody just to stop unless they were already stopped there. Well, I know that Karen and Jolene had told police that they knew that there was a spot out on Colonial Parkway that Kathy and Becky would go to to be alone sometimes. Now, they didn't know exactly where on the parkway that spot was. Okay. But they did know that they would go there sometimes. Okay. So... Everybody's assumed that they went out there on purpose that night to the parkway. 
there's no, I just don't see any way that the murders happened at the location the car was found. No, because there'd be blood everywhere. Right, and there wasn't. And, and footprints. And, and it's and obvious somebody had driven that car. Right. So, it's, I would think that it's more likely that they were parked in one of these locations that were off of the road. Because if you're parked in, you're only 10 to 15 feet off of the road. They couldn't go search those locations, though, to find, like, well, evidence? I, I think they did. They just didn't, they didn't find anything. Because when I first heard of these murders a long time ago, I, it was the fact, hey, these two, it was Lover's Lane murders. Yeah. These two women were parked out on the parkway and killed, which made it sound like that, the storyline was that these two were parked. Someone came upon them and killed them in this in that spot. But the more you go into this, there's just no way that no. that was possible. They didn't die at the location where their bodies were found. I don't believe that for a second, because you're not, this. These people had to encounter these women. They had to first of all get control of them. Yeah. The two strong, athletic. I mean, Kathy Thomas had been trained in martial arts. Yeah. So they had to somehow get control of these women, get them tied up, cut their throats, put them in the car, push their car over the, try to catch their car on fire, push their car over the edge. That takes a lot of time. Yeah. And you're not going to do that. You're not going to attempt to do all of that 10 to 15 feet from the no. roadway. No. You're just, you're just not. So I, I believe that it's more likely that they did go out to the parkway that night to be alone. Maybe even got some food and took it out there to eat. I don't know, but it that they did go out there. But it was probably they were parked on one of these locations that were off of the parkway, like the pic, one of the picnic areas. Yeah, and that's either that, or they may have been now. I will say that Bill Thomas, Kathy's brother, he said that very soon into this investigation, when it first happened, that their family was told by the FBI that they thought that it was very possible that Kathy and Becky had been encountered by an authority figure or someone pretending to be an authority figure. And I'm pretty sure the reason they thought that was the fact that Kathy's wallet was out. Like she was maybe getting her driver's license. Unless she had gotten her wallet out to pay for some drive through Right. Could be. You know, I don't know. Or, I mean, because I, I, mean, I don't always put my wallet back when I get drive through Not right then. Yeah. Anyway. But that, to me, would also make sense as to how someone would be able to get them under control. Because for a little while, you know, you're going to be thinking that you're going to be complying because you think that it's like a police officer or a ranger or somebody like that. Now, there's going to come a point where you realize that that's not true, but it may be too late by then. Yeah. To where, because I'm sure the only way they would, if they had to have had a gun, first of all, to get them under control. I don't think there's any other way that two athletic, young one trained in martial arts. Well, it depends on the person that killed them. Because if they had training also, but it would if not it was be one hard. person, they had to have a gun. I don't think it was one person. If it was, they had a gun. I don't know if it was or not. I'm We're, just saying, I will get I into, yeah, just we'll get into theories later. But was. I, even if it's two people, it's possible they may have had to have a gun to get these two women tied up. Again, it depends on what they're trained in. Right. So, And, you know, it, it all depends. Right. Now, they did do some searches along the roadway looking for the gun. I mean, not the gun. I'm sorry. The knife. <laughs> they didn't find it. They did contact uh, the Navy at Cheetham Annex to see if there had been anything weird going on. Check their logs to see if anything odd had been going on at the Navy base during the time of the murders or when they thought the murders had occurred and there was really nothing suspicious on that. 
But, I mean, if it's somebody, if it had been somebody from the naval base, it would just be somebody going in and coming out. I mean, I don't. Yeah, that wouldn't you know, really going be and leaving. suspicious. Yeah, <laughs> probably wouldn't be suspicious. Without really having any other leads to turn to, the FBI agents kind of turned their attention to the fact that Kathy and Becky were lesbians and then turned to their little tight circle of friends. Okay. And they really zeroed in on Jolene Shira, Kat, Karen Miller, and Deb Hill. Now, Deb Hill was actually another of Kathy's friends that she had met while serving in the Navy. Okay. And they were, I guess, they knew that Jolene and Kathy were exes. Right, okay. Now, they did know that Jolene is the one that introduced Kathy and Becky, but they still thought that maybe there was a possibility that there was some jealousy there. Right, right. And since Jolene and Karen were really the last ones that they were with, mm-hmm. I mean, that's where they went to question. And they kind of, they pushed them pretty hard and they didn't make any bones about it. That The FBI, I think in the beginning, really assumed that this was done by Jolene and Karen, that they were the ones that, because they knew where they were. Make, but what would make them think that? Just because, just because they knew where they go and they knew They knew where they ex. were. It was the, she was, it may have been a love triangle thing, which, I mean, kind of makes sense. It does, and but you have Because nothing. they were the last ones that they were seen with. But that doesn't make them murderers. No, it doesn't. It, that's my point. But that, I mean, the fact, of that, the fact that they would be looking at those women is not surprising. Now, it no, might have no. been the reason that they pushed so hard was gonna, because of a little prejudice. Well, you're going to um, always look at the people closest to them first. Right. That's that's just a And given. it's the last people they were seen with. Jolene's Kathy's ex. I mean, there were some reasons to look in that direction. Now, was there a reason to maybe push them as hard as they, they did? Because they wanted to solve the case as quick as or possible. Or there may have been a little not understanding the lifestyle and maybe a little prejudice there, too. I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm just saying that it could be one of the reasons. But, I mean, there really was no evidence whatsoever to point to the fact that Jolene and Karen or Deb had anything to do with it. Right. And one thing I find kind of sad about this is that group of friends kind of fell apart after that because Deb Hill was actually, you know, when the FBI came to talk to her, she was, you know, free with information, telling everything she knew because, in her words, she was trying to find who killed her friend. Right. Now, Karen and Jolene, because they were being questioned so hard, they kind of went into protective mode and kind of blamed Debbie Deb for talking to the FBI thinking that maybe they were she was turning on them they got anyway that friendship broke up because Uh Deb was talking to the FBI now I don't know what difference it would have made and why Karen and Jolene got so upset about Deb Hill talking to the FBI that's the only thing I find a little suspicious and that part I don't understand because if they're, unless they think that Deb, unless they think that Deb thinks that they were involved. I don't think so. That's the only reason they would get upset, though, is what yeah. I'm saying. But I think she's just trying to help yeah. any way she right. can. Right, I think so, too. And, I mean, I've never been in that situation where I I've been I've accused never had by the FBI of situation. killing my best, you know, some of my best friends. So it may just be that, you know, they were just really nervous about anybody talking to the FBI about them and what they may tell them but my that the FBI is, might construe to be Well, my point is, is if you didn't do anything wrong, you have nothing to be nervous right. about. So anyway, that's um so that group of friends just pretty much fell apart after these murders happened. And the FBI questioning Jolene and Karen had was the was a big reason for that. And the fact that Kathy Thomas was kind of the glue that held them all together anyway. Right. Because she was kind of the centerpiece, you know. She was the one that really brought them all together. Right. Now, when the FBI didn't find any evidence on, on Kathy, from Kathy's friends, they start zeroing in on Becky's acquaintances and anybody that may have had a possible motive. Now, Becky had a boyfriend 
named Far- Farouk M. Butt. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but <laughs> his name. I have no words. <laughs> now they thought that him being a Muslim and coming from a culture that, from the United Arab Emirates, that was really intolerant of homosexuality, and the fact that Becky had broken up with him when she met Kathy, so he had been jilted. Not only for another lover, but a woman. So they thought, well, maybe he was really pissed about that. And maybe he had something to do with it. So they went, they scrutinized him. But he had an alibi that he was in Washington, D.C. the weekend of the murders. Now, Washington, D.C. is only two hours away. I was thinking to say, that really doesn't make it, make... I mean, I don't know how... He could have driven back and forth. It's only a couple of hours. hours. Maybe there was something else. That's what I meant. Maybe there's something else besides just him being in Washington, D.C. Well, it may be. There's probably people that he was with that corroborated his alibi, would be my guess. And they would if he was there. Right, that's my point. (laughs) But he could have still driven... After the murders, two hours. After everyone was asleep. So, they still don't have any clear motive in this case. The wallets were found with money, so it's not robbery. They didn't really find anything that led them to the jealousy theory. Okay. So, the FBI, they sent all the information to their behavioral science unit at Quantico. In order for them to develop a profile of Mm -hmm. the killer or killers. This led the the FBI to arrive at a new theory, which is dubbed the Waterman Theory. Okay. And the Waterman Theory is basically this. They had the piece of line in Kathy's hair, and they're calling it right. line because, as opposed to rope, it was actually nautical line. They had the diesel fuel poured over the car and the bodies. They had Kathy's head that was almost severed. The FBI knows that most of the boats, because you know this roadways got rivers on each side. Right, right, right. Most of most boats that go up and down those waterways run on diesel, but these watermen, fishermen, boaters, they don't actually buy diesel at the marina Mm-mm. because it costs so much. Yeah. So what they do, buy, they buy diesel at the gas stations, put it in gas cans carry it to and from their boat and right use, yeah use it that way now the cuts were so sharp you know as they almost decapitated kathy uh-huh. that it would take an extremely sharp knife to do that the type of knife that a fisherman would use to fi- while fishing or to clean fish or right to fillet yeah. a fish and that's pretty much it <laughs> that's all they've got that led them to think <laughs> that it was a fisherman. That because yeah, that it was a waterman. That somebody because nobody else could have nautical line and a sharp. Well, knife. I mean, I guess you know the nautical or, or diesel fuel, right? And they're thinking, you know, that it, this was stuff that they would have had with them. Well, I mean, if anybody... they, they just came up, their theory is that for this theory to be valid, it would mean that the killer or killers just happened to come in contact with Kathy and Becky. I don't think so. I think it was, I mean for this theory to be I know because but they're because the whole point of it is the fact is surrounds is <laughs> the whole point of the theory is the fact that they would have had this stuff on them. Well anybody could have had that stuff on them though. Well I'm just saying that I mean I don't carry around nautical lines but some or people do diesel fuel. Well I'm just some saying. people some people do. I don't know why, but they do. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Crazy people. Name one, people. name one person you know right now that carries around nautical well, I mean, line anybody could have had a boat. Fuel. Anybody could have had a boat that run off diesel fuel. That's what they're saying. That it, it may have been somebody that yeah, had but, a boat. That's the waterman theory. But it could have still been anybody else that just happened to have some nautical line. I mean, there are a lot of things that run off diesel is my point. Okay, Not just but boats. I mean, there's, this is what their theory is. This is why this is the one type of person that they think would have all three of these things for a reason. That's the theory, basically. 
when they got the information back from, when they got the profile back, basically, they said that two men, it was clearly two men, that one guy didn't take charge of these girls. One would be dominant over the other. They would be macho. And that they were probably watermen. And they would have a typical macho vehicle. Which I guess means like a truck, (laughs) I guess. What? And the thinking at the time was that the killer did not come prepared to commit the crime. That this was just stuff, like I said, that they would have had with them. Or it could have been somebody that was out to kill them on purpose that when they they just bought this stuff just because. So they're just saying that these were all tools that they had with them and they were tools of convenience. But my question is, first of all, a waterman, wouldn't a waterman know that you can't really ignite diesel fuel? Yes, they would. And another thing. The FBI, according to Bill Thomas, Kathy's brother, the FBI told him, because this theory, this Waterman theory makes it sound like this is a disorganized killer, because mm-hmm. they're just winging it, basically. But the FBI told Bill Thomas that the killer was organized, and they thought brought the stuff with them to the crime in order to commit these crimes. Exactly. So which is it? I'm thinking that it's somebody that brought the stuff with them. But my point is, why did it change? And I guess that could be because this was later, years later, that the FBI told Bill Thomas that they thought this was an organized killer. So maybe it was a different investigator. Maybe it was a different profiler. Probably. But it's a total turnaround from the original profile. Right. I don't think it was a fisherman for the single fact that, one, you're right, they would know you cannot easily light diesel fuel on fire. Two, they would not use nautical line in the off chance that some of it got left behind because they would know, okay, that's the first place they're going to look. Right. Right. Because, I mean, just because they fish for a living, they're not stupid. Right. (laughs) Exactly. I just just feel that uh, somebody that... I just feel somebody that deals with diesel fuel on a daily basis is going to know that knows it's not, that. yeah, no. Because I knew that, and I don't yeah. even deal with it on well, a daily basis. Well, I deal with it on a daily basis, but I mean, it takes a lot for that stuff to even explode. Like, when you have a school bus fire, which you're sitting on 100 gallons of diesel fuel, do you know most times the diesel tank is still intact because it did not, not burn, burn and did not right, explode? Right, because it does, because it takes so much heat and I a mean, school like even, bus can burn down in three minutes and right. it's going to take longer for the diesel fuel to heat up enough to burn well even you, even if you've got a diesel truck you have to, uh, not on the newer ones but even like you would have to go and turn the ignition on to heat the fuel up before the truck would even mm-hmm. turn over i yeah. mean it just it because diesel fuel will gel in extremely cold right, weather yes but I just feel like that somebody that deals with diesel fuel that much would know that. Yeah. That it doesn't burn easily. No, it doesn't. So, you know, the FBI, they, they I think that they just start investigating based on this original profile. Yeah. And I think they run with this lead that it's a waterman. And now, they, they got... also are lead, I think they're also leading maybe... T- <laughs> They're thinking that it may have been a park ranger. It could have been. Now, there were some. Now, they would have nautical line, too. Yeah, I mean. And they would have access to diesel also. Yeah. Now, there were allegations that some of the park rangers may may have been involved. And attention focused on two rangers. And let me say this up front. There's people that that don't want to name names. In this case, but let me say this, I'm going to name these names for the simple fact that they have already been named in and made public in a book that was published, which is uh, one of the sources that I used for this case right? study. So I'm going to name them simply for the fact that they've already been named and made public. Right. I'm not accusing anyone of anything. No, we, we, when we name names, we are not accusing. No, I'm not accusing anyone unless, of anything. Unless we're talking about somebody like 
Ed Gein. Or, <laughs> that we know is guilty. Yeah, that we <laughs> no, know are guilty. Yeah, I'm not. I'm just naming these names, going over these names because they have been made public. So it's not any. It's not new news. Now, one of these rangers was Clyde Yee, and as you know, we had talked about him earlier that he mm-hmm. was one of the first to the scene. He seemed to be a viable person of interest, but. That theory didn't hold water because he actually was polygraphed and passed. Now, we all know my feelings on polygraphs. Yeah, but, but I don't... I mean, he was cleared for that, and there really wasn't any other evidence against him. Right. So, I mean, that was looked at as a theory, It's, but he was cleared. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to say there, that he was cleared. So, the FBI, they're... Their leads just keep drying up everywhere they turn. They're not finding anything that leads them anywhere. They had theories, but no solid evidence. They had a profile, but it led them nowhere. Okay. And the case went cold, and there was nothing new that came up in this case. That is until 11 months later, on September 20th of 1987. Okay. Okay. And if you would like to know what happened September 20th, 1987, you can join us next week. Yay! <laughs> for part two dun, dun, dun. <laughs> of the Colonial Parkway murders. To be continued. To be continued. That's where we're going to stop for this week. We uh, want to recommend a book that's available on Audible. We're going to do that each week. And this week's book is the one that I was just speaking about. That's one of the sources for this episode. It's called A Special Kind of Evil by Blaine L. Pardo and Victoria R. Hester. And you can visit audibletrial.com slash one crime, and you can receive a 30-day trial and get access to that book. So if you would like to, if you would like to read ahead and know more. <laughs> Cheaters. <laughs> you can Cheaters. do that. Uh, other sources for this um, included the Colonial Park Rim of Parkway Murders Facebook page, which is actually ran by Bill Thomas, who, as I've said, is Kathy Thomas's brother. Mm-hmm. There were several news segments from WAVY TV 10 and 13 News Now, and interviews with Bill Thomas on podcasts, uh, Real Crime Profile, and Who Killed Amy Mahalovic. So, um, a thing I want to start doing at the end of these episodes, since we talk about all this morbid stuff, and since we're going to start releasing our episodes on Mondays. We're going to do Monday's Moron. (laughs) This is where we're going to tell a story about a dumb criminal. (laughs) Just to lighten (laughs) We don't have enough of those to go forever. So, Monday's Moron. This week's Monday's Moron. Of of course, it's from Florida. (laughs) Wow, that's shocking. I love you all my Florida people, but y'all got a lot of stupid people. Y'all got a lot of crazy people down there. Not all of you, but a lot. <laughs> so, the headline. <laughs> Go ahead. Do you want me to read uh, it? No. I Are do you not. sure? I because I don't it. think you're going to get through it without. I do. I honestly don't. Headline: Troopers arrest men after finding drugs in bag marked bag full of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess they were trying. They'll never look in here. That's too obvious. Two men were arrested in Santa Rosa, Florida, Santa Rosa County, Florida, after law enforcement officers said they found illegal drugs in a bag labeled "bag full of drugs." The men were pulled over by a state trooper for allegedly speeding 25 miles over the speed limit. Yeah, they okay, were running if you've drugs. Got drugs. Do not speed. <laughs> you follow idiots. You follow every. Damn Freaking track it, traffic, traffic law to a T. <laughs> Almost to the point where they're going to ask you, are you okay? <laughs> you drive like you're driving drunk. <laughs> yeah, because when you're yeah. driving drunk, you don't want to go too fast, but you don't want to go too slow. Make sure right. you stop at all right. you're stop trying to signs, break. all red lights. Don't drive drunk. Don't. Don't drive don't. drunk. Just to say, but that's kind of the if you're dealing drugs, if you've got drugs, if you're in your running car, drugs, you do right. not want to break the law to cause attention to yourself. So Santa Rosa <laughs> canine deputies recently assisted Florida Highway Patrol on a traffic stop on I ten, of course, <laughs> well, where, wow. a, <laughs> where a large there. amount of narcotics was discovered. Note to self: Do not traffic illegal narcotics in bags labeled "bag full of drugs." <laughs> Our canines can read. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, that's funny. But yeah. The narcotics and other contraband found reportedly included 75 gra- grams of methamphetamine. Jesus. 1.36 kilograms of GHB, 1 gram of cocaine. My God. 3.6 grams of fentanyl, and 15 MDA tablets. Wow. <laughs> Y'all were running drugs. So, you know. Was just, there a police gonna... chase? <laughs> Because they they all. Well, I mean, well, we've got that bag full of drugs, Mark. Bag full of drugs. Oh, they'll never look in there. Just pull over. That way, they won't be suspicious. Oh gosh, by the bag full of drugs. (laughs) We can't can't let them like we're. We got to play it cool, guys. We got to play it cool. Don't act like we're guilty, right? So they'll never look in a bag labeled "bag full of drugs." So that's our segment of Monday Moron for this week. <laughs> <laughs> Just to lighten the mood I up a am, little. Yeah, I know you're speechless. There's, I no, am. there's nothing else to say about that. So you crazy people down in Florida. <laughs> so remember, you can email us one crime at a time yes. at gmail dot com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all at one crime pod. And the biggest thing that you can do to help us out is to rate us and yes, give us a please. written review on Apple Podcasts. We would greatly, and we'll greatly, eventually greatly get to reading them when she gets over this. Only wanting to read one a week. Well, I don't want to run out. <laughs> now, before we get out of here, we are going to play a promo for the podcast, The Shonen Flop, and it's a show where host David and Jordan they cover an anime show that didn't quite make it to legendary status. <laughs> so we'll let them Did tell you. Did any of them make it to legendary status? <laughs> oh, yeah. There's a lot of them. Okay. I, I know. I know because my child watches it like crazy. So, yeah, there's a lot of them. So we will um, bid you adieu and let the guys tell you about their podcast. Yes. So until next week, remember to only dive into one crime at a time. <laughs> That's our new tag. All right. <laughs> That fast? Yep. All right. All right, guys. We'll see you next week. See ya. Bye. Bye. Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Naruto, all things that we love, all manga that were originally published in the legendary magazine Weekly Shonen Jump. But not every series can run for 300 chapters and have a hit anime. This is David. This is Jordan. We're the hosts of Shonen Flop. Each episode, we look at manga that ran and jumped that didn't quite make it. We discuss what it did wrong, what it did right, how the series could have turned itself around, and ultimately, was it a flop? or not. Run all your favorite podcast apps, and you can find us at shonenflop.com. Keep on flopping, floppers.